<laughs> so many things to carry. It's a cool, stylish entrance. Thank you. So you, you guys will talk amongst yourself. I'm going to do a little <laughs> <laughs> arrangement. You're going to put on a puppet show for us. First of all, it's a wonderful <coughs> film. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Oh, well. um, how did you first get the idea of creating this story? Right, yeah, when did it? Well, it was quite a while ago. It was about, I think it was about 10 years ago that we... we, <laughs> we th was it 10 or it's, 8? It's grown two years since this morning. It's, it <laughs> <laughs> well, years, the original bad. idea, I, I suppose, came from... We, we love the tradition of Christmas specials, and we grew up watching them. And um, there's something really special about the, the sort of ritual of, of watching, um, you know, we grew up watching uh, Raymond Briggs' Snowman and all the Wallace and Gromit films that came out in the UK every year. And they were such a formative part of us sort of getting into filmmaking. And we always dreamed of, of perhaps making one one day. And um, yeah, so we were chatting about that and then we thought, oh, well, I should come up with some ideas. <laughs> it was actually my wife that sort of said, why don't you make one about a Robin? Because Robins are very... Um, sort of iconic as a British sort of bird around Christmas time. Are, are they iconic in the US as well, as a I, synonymous I don't think with Christmas? No. Probably no, not, but, 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 in, but in Britain, <laughs> Robins are like... But they will like be now. The, um, <laughs> from in the future. They, from now on. Yeah, they're, they're sort of on every Christmas card around Christmas time. And um, yeah, so we, we sort of came up with this idea, and w right from the beginning we thought it would be lovely to tell the story of... Um, yeah, a Robin brought up by a family of mice and... Um, and we love the idea of them her meeting a materialistic magpie and them going on like a, a heist to steal the star uh, of a Christmas, uh, on top of a Christmas tree. Um, and then it was about, I, I guess like about four or five years, I'm probably exaggerating again, um, of us sort of uh, cultivating and just sort of sitting on the idea really. And, and we'd, um, we'd often tell the story to our friends and families at Christmas time. Um, sort of say, oh, we've got this idea for a Christmas film. And, um, and you always kind of, I guess we've probably sort of fine-tuned the story over that time by telling people, and if they started to walk away mid-story, you thought, okay, maybe it's not quite right yet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and over that time as well, we wrote a script and uh, made a little storybook of it because we thought, well, if we do come around to showing it to someone, um, maybe that's a nice way to kind of digest the story. And, um, and then we bumped into Sarah Cox, who is um, uh, at Ardman at Annecy Film Festival in France. And it was a sort of really unplanned meeting. Um, and we ju it just occurred to us that we had this idea for a Christmas special. So we, we sort of pitched it there and then. Mm. And, we actually, um, on, on, well, D Dan was on his knees in the middle of the canteen <laughs> with the book. And I was on the sofa next to her and I sung, sung the magpie song. <laughs> It was a very, very strange pitch, yeah, I think and I think that really helped <laughs> the whole experience of it. But I think probably because we'd, we'd um, sort of told it so many times uh, just for the, for the love of the story, it probably, uh, I guess Sarah could see some of the enthusiasm we had for the film, and she loved it just as much, and then fairly quickly after that we pitched it to Netflix and Alexi Wheeler at um, Netflix, and he really loved it as well. It was quite a surreal... Um, uh, chain of events because it very quickly just got um, greenlit and, and was being made only sort of four or five months after we we sort of showed it to Sarah so um, yes and then and then obviously in making it it, it developed quite a lot well a, a lot from that um, original idea but but we still had the sort of same um, I guess temp poles of the story and the yeah <laughs> uh Stop motion animation often refers to itself in the specific medium, like claymation or something like that. What medium do you use for the characters and the puppets? Uh, what material and how is it different than, say, an Aardman film like uh, Wallace and Gromit or Shaun the Sheep? Mm. Well, it's a, uh, yeah, feltimation. Uh, I don't think that's a very good word. No, that's, that's, that's not really what it's called at all. I mean, there, there, is, um, there's a, there is a growing tradition of uh, felt stop motion animation. Um, I don't think it has coined its own sort of moniker yet, but um, I mean, th there are lots of similarities between working with felt and claymation in that it's obviously extremely tactile. You can kind of see the physicality of it right there on screen. It's got that little boil, that kind of 
sometimes called crawl, where you can feel the fingerprints of the animators. So when you're looking at it, you can really connect with how it's been made. And I think that's such a nice thing in the world to understand how something's been made, because so much of the world is unintelligible, that um, being able to understand something is very satisfying. But, that, but there's lots of other elements of it which I think sit it really firmly within like the, the context of like the, the Ardman canon. Um, I suppose the, we, I mean, we, we, we grew up on Ardman films and, and other amazing stop motion films like the Henry Selleck's uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. But, you know, so we, we, we share a lot of those kind of sensibilities of humor and um, we, we, we put a brass band in the score and I think that really <laughs> sort of <laughs> uh, rings those Ardman bells. But, um, yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned the score is uh, really important because, to my awareness, this was the first Ardman musical uh, animated film, uh, which we usually most of their, their characters are, are silent completely, so they don't get a chance to sing much. But yeah. there's a lot of singing here. And, <laughs> and musicals mean that you have to, it impacts your storyboarding, it impacts your characterization and the recording from the actors. Why did you choose to do that, and at what point did you completely commit to the idea? Yeah, the, um, I think the original idea just sort of came from, we, we thought it would be funny if, in, in a very early script, if Magpie had heard some carol song singing and, and misinterpreted them. And, um, and so we wrote a kind of song that was based on a, a Christmas carol. And then from then we sort of developed, we thought, ah, oh, it would be just really fun to make a musical. and. Um, yeah, I mean, part of the, th in terms of storytelling with the musical, that was a really exciting extra dimension to storytelling because um, we were fortunate enough to work with the bookshop band who scored the whole film and wrote all the music um, right from the beginning. So when we were kind of writing our script and working with the story team to um, figure out each scene visually, we were also working with them and they would send over sketches of melodies and, and, and give us kind of what placeholder score for the whole film right from the beginning. So we, we didn't have to use placeholder score, really. They, they're very, they've got a very quick working uh, style. And, um, and yeah, so, so that was a real benefit to, to be able to weave in the, the music and the score right from the beginning. And, um, and yeah. And you two both wrote the lyrics as well. We did, yeah. We did, yeah. I mean, one, one of the other things I think of, of sort of why it, it, it has to be a musical, it's, you know, it's a, it's a story about a, a loud bird in a family of quiet mice, and she could either be loud by shouting, which would be just a really unpleasant film to watch, or she could be loud by singing, and, and that's, uh, and, and sort of, yeah. So I think that is why it's a musical, it's because it's, core to the story. It was, yeah, when, when we figured out that that thread could be woven in in a musical sense and that her song at the beginning is very different to the sneak song, which is the mice's uh, melody and theme, and it kind of jars with that. And, and the, the sort of, um, I guess the story of the melody within the film is that her, her song and melody doesn't quite fit anywhere until the end, until she really embraces it. And, and the final song is a mixture of the sneak song the Mice's song and, um, and her song to sort of blend. So we, once we realized that we could use melody and song to, to tell the story, that was really exciting. And, and it's based on a real Robins, so, uh, well, a, a UK's Robins uh, little chirp. Yeah, the little doodle doodle, doodle, doodle is, a, is a part of their melody. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like working with the actors in terms of just not only building the characterizations, but specifically for the songs that each one sings? Um, yeah, I mean, we were absolutely thrilled to be able to get the cast that we did. I mean, we don't still quite know how, how that <laughs> happened, but um, yeah, Richard, Richard E. Grant was an incredibly generous performer. Um, he would just really, really get into all the singing and particularly, you know, obviously the, the Magpie song, which he treated like this incredible show tune. Um, with, with Gillian Anderson, who plays the cat, uh, we we initially, we had sort of written it as more of a kind of show tune, kind of like big, big number, but we found that actually, well, we, we got her to just read it as a poem on one of our rehearsals, and we found that was so sinister <laughs> that it was perfect, and we realized that, oh, of course, like, the cat wouldn't bother singing 
in a really enthusiastic way to like her lunch. She would, she just wouldn't go to that effort, and that, so it, it, it was perfect to, um, yeah, just get her to sort of basically whisper the song. And uh, Brandy Carmichael, right? Bron Bronte. Bronte yeah. Carmichael, thank you. Um, she does such a wonderful job of building a character who is full of naive overconfidence, I think. Mm. Um, what was it like building and walking her through that entire characterization? Well, um, I mean, she was just fantastic right from the beginning. And we, we actually, we, we put the casting out to the sort of whole country and we, we must have seen hundreds of different reels of, um, of kids sending uh, their auditions in. And, and as soon as we came across Bronte's uh, tape, we just thought, there she is, that's amazing. She's got such a warmth and, and um, sort of joy to her voice, but she's also, she kind of, she's sort of funny in it and, and it is a really difficult thing to get that naive uh, humor because it can easily just sound like you're sort of making fun of them but she just had such a great positive kind of tone to her voice um so when we found her and we we actually um with with her we um got the re recording of her audition and um took it down to the um animation studio and we um worked with a couple of animators to um to sort of do some tests with her voice just to see how it sat in the puppet puppet sort of um so we we got these first few performances of of Robin and Bronte's voice and it was really amazing because after such a long time of having this character in your head and sort of searching for who she really is suddenly she was just there like in we, the, met, we met her we met her for the first time and it was uh, it was brilliant so yeah right from that begin at that point uh, Bronte was incredible and um and she was yeah she was so good at um well, she's she's a very experienced uh, um, actor, even though she's um, um she's very young, and um yeah she just she got the character straight away. And One thing that's so wonderful about uh, stop motion is that you can see a lot of the craftsmanship in the details of the production design, you know, and you have different scales, you have lots of close ups, but also big canvases too, like the the kitchen or the living room, um, but that also means that you have to have different. Uh, the characters at different scales. How many different scales uh, did the or did Robin or Bag Magpie have uh, in order to make sure that they fit in the different uh, settings that you build? Mm. Well, I think uh, the, the intention is always to have one scale because that's nice and easy for for production. Uh, I think we had at least three. I think we had we had four, Maybe didn't we? Four, I think, and then yeah. Were like pretend it was like scales. an unofficial scale so, that we. So this is a scale. So this is like the the main scale, which most of the performance, and then we'd have B scale, which is like half. So for lots of the shed scene, that's sort of all sort of built at uh, kind of like life size. Um, and then there was even C scale, which is tiny, tiny, right, tiny. Tiny. Um, <laughs> So for yeah, so for like the kitchen, so so A scale is like 170 percent. I think so. Yeah, it's about yeah. And and yeah, and so that would be like what the kitchen is built at, and so you'd have this amazing feeling of like being really tiny <laughs> going into these. Like, so that big, whole kitchen big, like, scene, which you know when they sneak in, that we built that entire kitchen, and um, it, that was I mean that was the sort of in a way the biggest set because of because of that, and um, it did feel like it was like the first thing we did as well, and because yeah. and, and, it was our first project to Ardman, we'd said to them, oh no, come on, like, that's ridiculous, don't do it. We'll, we'll find another way, we'll find another way. But they're like, no, welcome to Ardman, we're gonna do it. <laughs> and, they, and so they built this like massive oversized set. Yeah, which, so, yeah it was very amazing. fun, because every element in it had, had been scaled up, so you did feel like you, you were shrinking when you were in there. Um. <laughs> Are there some inherent uh, challenges about using felt puppets versus other puppets? I mean, the, the, the payoff, of course, is the textural detail and the, the vivid nature of how it looks. Uh, but what are some of, the, what are some of the, the challenges about building it, too? The, the downsides. Yeah, I mean, um, we had quite a, a long period of R&D to kind of figure out how we would um, make the puppets. and. Needle felt has is is like wonderful as you've as you said and um, but it does have its limitations because it's not very flexible and mostly when you make stop motion puppets you want the material to be really flexible so you can pose it in any position. Um, so the the puppet department and the animation department had quite a 
a sort of task, just figuring out how to achieve the level of um, expression within the confines of needle felt. But we, we often found that it was quite lo-fi techniques that were the most successful. So Robin's head, which um, she, we wanted her to be really mobile -like and bird-like, but if you made it as one piece, um, if you made it just a fully needle felted character, it would just tear at the neck and be really immobile. So we tried loads and loads of different techniques, <laughs> but in the end what we found is just like a, basically a ball in like an egg, egg cup and needle felt has this ability to kind of self sort of, it kind of covers the seam because it's got, um, <clears throat> got a, a woolen edge to it. So although we did digitally tidy it up in parts, um, mostly it's just, it just sort of um, sorted itself sorted out. Sorted itself out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and equally, uh, yeah, and, so, and then a lot of the, the bigger gestures, say Robin's wings, they're replacement wings, so if she does a big movement, we'll switch between different models so you don't have to kind of make one, uh, one armature that can do everything. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a really lovely material and it's, it's, it's quite immediate. Uh, you know, you can make a, a quick puppet out of it um, just at home and although it, you know it'll have its limitations it's kind of got an instant charm to it and they, they sort of some materials when you make puppets out of them they sort of seem to have a kind of I don't know endearing soul straight away and I think needle felt is is that is a sort of material that does that well that I think that brings us to the fact that I mean uh Ardman has done such a wonderful job of building these franchises where these characters, we've grown to know them over time, um, but building a new world with new characters that have to be very vivid and have to be very immediately accessible. Uh, what was that like having to build those that you instantly are drawn to, but at the same time, they still are very distinct and separate? Wow, yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 there, there was a certain degree of, of pressure um, coming into Ardman, having grown up, uh, you know, being fed on their films. Um, I, I guess, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. That, I mean, the, the, the characters have always been quite sort of vivid in our minds. Um, you know, Richard E. Grant as Magpie, he was sort of uh, the center of our pin board for the character of Magpie, particularly his uh, portrayal of with nail and with nail and I, um, and I guess you know, sitting with the story for so long and letting it filter down to to quite basic ingredients was was really helpful because when it came to designing these characters and 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 piecing together all the bits of them, you know, the the, the voice actor, the, um, how they're going to physically. Be and how they're going to move as well. You know, the Ian Whitlock, our animation supervisor, did an amazing job of all the research and development of how how these characters move as well. But we always had a sight on you know what the core nubbin of of these characters are. <coughs> one one thing to mention as well is um, Matt Forsyth, who's our character designer and production designer on the film. Um, because I mean, we didn't necessarily set out to make like iconic. We weren't like, we want this character to be iconic. <laughs> we just, you know, we were trying to make them as, um, I don't know, as expressive in their, just in their shape. If you know, if you look at them, we just want them to, you know, read who that character is and, and understand perhaps a bit about their character just from looking at them. And Matt Forsyth um, is just a, such a wonderful illustrator and he works, he's, he's a very 2D illustrator. Um, they're very, and, and he's very focused on the outline and the, the overall um, simple shapes of characters, so I think working with him that gave it a distinct look, and and it means that you know the silhouette of all the characters are quite distinct. Hopefully, mm. I think that helps you kind of. We really we were really happy when we came up with the bauble. <laughs> Robin's basically a Christmas bauble, which sort of feels right. <laughs> What's next for Robin and the Mouse family? Well, the theme park. <laughs> um, <laughs> The egg ride that the you sort of ride. like roll down a big yeah. tree. That's the thing uh, we're really free tattoos to... in the lobby. <laughs> Anybody who wants. Um, um, well, we, it, it's certainly a world we'd love to tell a lot more stories in, but it's probably you know we're we're, we're very happy to finish this film <laughs> um, and and put it out there and you know feel the response from people has been really really wonderful. It, so hopefully we'll hopefully we'll do more. 
It is a real joy to make a family film. I think it's like the first family film that we've watched, and we've got young families ourselves, and and to make something that um, you know, and you watch it with with families, and to see how it's received, and um, that's very inspiring to make more. I think, <laughs> in that sense. Well, Mikey, Dan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so oh, much. Well, now, if you. Thank if you anyone <laughs> if anyone wants to come up and take a closer look, uh, you can stay yes, there, yeah. and then we'll, we can show it to you. Uh, off the edge of the stage. I'll, I'll bring the table forward, right? So, but thank you so much for coming. Uh, spread thank the word so much, about yeah. Robin Robin, and uh, we hope to see you again at the Rafael soon. Thank you. Thank you.